Hi everyone. In this Connect with Networking video, we're going to discuss Chapter 4, the Data Link Layer. Let's go ahead and get started. The Data Link Layer is Layer 2 in both the Internet and OSI model. It is directly above the physical layer, and it is the layer of the network stack that is responsible for how we are moving messages across our network. So we are taking a look at how we control the way that messages are sent on particular media. We're looking a little bit about how we organize the physical layer bit streams into coherent messages. So what are we doing with the pulses of electricity or light that the physical layer is sending? And how do we convert those to something that are meaningful? And we'll be discussing a couple of major functions when we discuss the data link layer, primarily media access control, error control, and message delineation. Media access control is determining what device is allowed to transmit and when. This is particularly important if we are dealing with a multipoint or shared circuit, like we see in modern Wi-Fi networks, or if we're dealing with a half duplex point to point circuit where you can only communicate one direction or the other. It's not as important in a point to point where we have full duplex, so we'll talk about it, but that's not necessarily where we focus as much of our interest. There have been two approaches to media access control that we've seen on networks, contention access and controlled access. Contention access allows devices that are participating on a particular network to transmit on a circuit when there is no other communication happening on that circuit. There's no centralized control of the circuit. Devices have to be polite and listen for traffic. When they don't hear anything happening, they can transmit. But if they do hear something happening on the channel, then they won't broadcast. They'll wait until they have some silence on the channel before they can broadcast. If a device starts to transmit and another device starts to transmit at the same time, there will be what's called a collision. And when that happens, devices have to stop transmitting, wait some amount of time, and then try again. So this is contention-based media access control, and it is collision tolerant. An alternative to contention-based media access control would be controlled access, and this is common in wireless local area networks. One way of managing controlled access would be access request, where a device has to get permission from some central authority, maybe your Wi-Fi router, to actually transmit, and only one device at any given moment in time has permission to communicate. An alternative to access request would be polling. We could do something like roll call polling, where a central device asks all of the other devices on the network if they have anything they want to transmit, and you just move from device to device to device and give each one an equal opportunity. Another way that we can handle polling is called hub polling or token passing where each device holds a virtual token and controls the media access while they're holding that token and then passes the token to the next device. Think about this as holding the talking pillow in Breaking Bad. The only person who's allowed to talk is the person who's holding the pillow in their lap. Contention-based access works particularly well with small amounts of traffic. So if you have a small network with few devices, or you have devices that aren't communicating all that frequently, then contention-based access works great. Think about being at a dinner table with just two or three of your friends. Contention-based access to the conversation would work just fine. You don't need to raise your hand or seek permission to talk. Each of you can be polite to one another, wait until someone else is finished talking, and then begin your part of the conversation. This starts to break down as you increase the amount of traffic by either increasing the amount that each device wants to communicate or increase the number of devices that are participating on the network. Think about a crowded room. If you didn't have people raise their hand to ask questions, you could have a lot of collisions, which would cause response times to go way up. By giving some controlled access, where only a person has a token or only the person who's been called on is allowed to talk, the overall amount of communication can improve. So controlled access is great for shared environments with lots of traffic. Contention-based media access control is great for smaller environments or environments that are relatively quiet. 
Another responsibility of this layer of the network is error control. Some of the most common types of error are corrupted data, where the zeros and ones are getting confused and aren't actually accurate, or lost data, where we're not actually receiving the signal we were supposed to receive. And what we're talking about here are errors that are caused by problems with transmission. This isn't a spelling mistake in a Word document or a mistyped email. Those are mistakes made by humans. This is where the email that you perfectly crafted doesn't get received on its recipient side because there was some sort of issue with the transmission. There are a few things we can be focused on with network errors. The first would be error prevention, stopping the error from occurring in the first place. The second would be error detection. If an error occurs, we need to know about it so that we can respond accordingly. And the third would be error correction. Once we've detected an error, what can we do to fix it? Some of the most common sources for network errors are things like line noise and distortion. When we're using electrical signaling, there can be radio signals or electrical signals that are interfering with the signals that are flowing across our network. Similarly, if we're using radio signals, we can absolutely have interference from other radio signals that are being broadcast in the same space. Any of these interferences could degrade the performance of a circuit and could result in things like extra bits, where you receive zeros and ones you're not supposed to receive, flipped bits, where a zero becomes a one or a one becomes a zero, or missing bits, you don't actually receive the information that you were expecting. Many sources of error can be improved by simple technological adjustments. If you're getting a lot of white noise where you're receiving a lot of extraneous information, increasing the signal strength can help. Think about trying to have a conversation with someone in a crowded, loud room. The best thing you can do to improve communication is speak more loudly. If you're seeing some sort of impulse noise, so sudden bursts of electricity, like lightning, that are causing interference, Shielding or moving your wires might help. Again, think about moving a conversation from a loud, crowded room to an outdoor area where there's not as much noise. We can remove the interference. Crosstalk is when channels that are next to each other are interfering with one another. The conversations are too close together. And the best thing we can do is move the conversations farther away by increasing the guard band width or adding some additional shielding. Again, think about moving away from noisy conversations so that your conversation can be more easily heard. Echo is when we have poorly tuned connections and that requires some sort of equipment repair. Attenuation is what happens when we send a signal over a long distance. And the best way to fix this is to use repeaters to boost the signal back up to its full strength. And finally, intermodulation noise is when several circuits accidentally combine to create a new signal that we don't actually mean to send, moving or shielding wires should fix this issue. After trying to prevent errors, the next thing we need to focus on is detecting errors, because no matter how hard we're trying to prevent an error from occurring, they will still happen. So the next important thing is to know when an error has actually occurred so that we can respond. One of the ways we do this on computer networks is adding a check value to the message that we're sending. Typically, the check value has to do with some sort of mathematical formula, and we can use the check value to check to see if the message is intact or not. Ideally, a check value is relatively small compared to the size of the message, so that we're not using up too much of our available network bandwidth on the check value, and we're reserving most of the bandwidth for the actual messages. When pursuing error detection, the sender sends a message with an associated check value to the receiver, the receiver does some sort of mathematical calculation with both the message and the check value to ascertain whether the message was sent correctly or not. The simplest version of error detection on a network would be what's called a parity check. And this is where we add one additional bit to our message to determine whether the entire message is correct or not. So for example, if we wanted to pursue an even parity one bit check value, we would add a zero or a one to a message that we want to send. And the user that receives that message would check to see if they have an even number of ones when they receive the message and the check value. If I was sending the letter A, which is represented by 01000001, that's eight bits that I would be sending to the recipient. 
I'm looking at the number of ones, and I would want to add a parity bit that allows for the nine bits that I send, eight bits of message and one parity bit, to still remain even in terms of the number of ones. So if I send 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, I've still sent an even number of ones. Conversely, if I wanted to send the letter C, which has three ones in its message, I would add an additional parity bit with the value of one to make it an even number of ones in the message plus the parity bit. This is a very simple technique, but it only detects around 50% of errors. If one of your bit flips, you'll know, but if two bits flip, you won't. When an even number of bits flip, you'll still have an even number of ones in your message plus your parity bit. If three bits flip, you'll know. If four bits flip, you won't. So this is not a particularly accurate way of detecting errors. A more robust version of error detection is checksum. This is where we add one byte or eight bits to a message. And then we do, again, another algorithmic check between the checksum and the message itself to see if the message is correct or not. The most robust way of creating an error detection technique is using cyclic redundancy check, or CRC. And this is used in modern networks today. We treat the entire message as a single binary number. We divide it by some sort of preset number that's part of the algorithm. And we use the remainder as our check value. When we use something like CRC16, which uses 16 bits for its checksum, we can detect around 99.998% of errors. And if we increase the size of CRC to 32, we detect almost 100% of all errors. So CRC has become very popular in modern network protocols. Once we've tried to prevent all our errors and we have an algorithm in place to detect errors, we need to decide how to respond when an error has actually occurred. The simplest version of correcting an error is asking for retransmission. Think about having a conversation with someone where you don't correctly hear what they have to say. It was mumbled or you weren't paying attention. The easiest way to correct that missing information is to ask that person to repeat themselves. And networks do the same thing. We use an algorithm called Automatic Repeat Request, or ARQ, that automatically requests information that wasn't properly received. An alternative to retransmission would be forward error correction, where we receive a message that isn't correct, but we use some sort of algorithm to fix the message without asking for retransmission. Think about listening to someone, not quite hearing what they had to say, but using some logic to infer what the message must have been. This is not always infallible, but it does allow you to not ask the person to repeat themselves, which may have significant advantages. Stop and wait ARQ asks the sender to send part of the message and then wait for us to acknowledge whether we received it correctly or not. If we send a non-acknowledgement, the sender will resend the data. So the sender sends a frame, the recipient doesn't receive any errors, so they send an acknowledgement. The sender sends a frame, but we detect some errors using something like CRC or checksum, so we send a non-acknowledgement. The sender resends the frame that had an error, we check it again, we don't detect any errors, we send an acknowledgement. Think about this as trying to provide your credit card number to someone on the phone. You say four digits, they say got it. You say another four digits, they say got it. You say another four digits and they say can you repeat that, and you do, and then they say they got it. It is possible that you send a packet and not only did the recipient not receive the proper information, they don't receive the packet at all. If when they receive a packet that has errors or they receive a packet that doesn't make any sense and they can't even respond, after a specific amount of time, the sender will automatically send that same piece of information again. So we can actually allow for timeouts where we are waiting for a response from the recipient and if a certain amount of time goes by, we just repeat ourselves. That does potentially mean that you'll get a situation where you've sent a frame, no errors were detected, but the acknowledgement isn't heard, and the same frame will be sent again. There's no harm here. You've received information twice with no errors, and you can just delete the duplicate. An alternative to stop and wait is continuous ARQ. 
In this case, the sender doesn't wait for acknowledgments before sending more information. And they use something called a sliding window to decide how many frames to allow before an acknowledgement is received. So the sender sends frame one. They don't wait. They send a second frame. In the meantime, they receive an acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement is specific. It says it's an acknowledgement for frame one. So it's not just got it, it's I got frame one. Frame three is sent with an error. The recipient has sent an acknowledgement for frame two. Frame four is sent. The recipient is sending a non-acknowledgement, but specifically for frame three. I did not receive frame three. Frame three gets resent. This does mean that the recipient has to buffer all of these frames because they might be receiving them out of order, and then they'll have to reassemble them in the proper order once they've received everything. Let's pause here and return to this chapter in a later video. Thanks so much for watching. See you next time.